there's a psychological aspect to loving your banjo, and it's not necessarily scientifically valid, but it doesn't have to be. It's something you have fallen in love with, it being a certain way, and it doesn't matter if it's the best or the worst or what somebody else thinks about it. If that's what you love, that's what you should have. Hey everyone, Keith Billick here. I hope this midsummer episode of the Picky Fingers Banjo Podcast finds all of you in exceptional health and hopefully at least somewhat sane. I know it's uh, crazy times and we're all getting by the best we can. So I hope that includes you and I hope uh, this podcast and, and hopefully your own banjo playing is helping everyone deal with all the madness. I happen to have some somewhat exciting news to report out of uh, Picky Fingers HQ here. After two years of doing this podcast, I finally got around to getting some merch. So I have now uh, stickers and also t-shirts with the lovely Picky Fingers Banjo podcast logo designed by Grace Fanthoff, as you uh, loyal listeners will will undoubtedly know that. Uh, But yeah, you can get now or put an asterisk by that, I'll explain. Uh, I got purple shirts, I got green shirts, I got dark gray shirts, they look fantastic. They're very comfy, very high quality, and uh, they are available. Now that being said, I'm. Uh, it might be bad form for me to jump the gun before it's completely live on the website, but I was just excited to let you know. But uh, at any rate, I'm putting the final touches on getting all those posted on my website. That's banjopodcast.com. And just click to get to the uh, shop link once you get there. And hopefully in the next day or two, so maybe by the time you're even listening to this, I will have everything up and ready to go for you to order. But uh, they're looking really good. And I mean, I, I hear that these are becoming already quite the status symbol. So if you wear your Picky Fingers Banjo Podcast t-shirt out, Everybody who you pass by will know that of you, that you are of superior intelligence and of the most sophisticated musical tastes. So like I said, uh, head over to banjopodcast.com. That's my website and check those out. But uh, like I said, again, maybe give me a quick day or two to get that finalized. But uh, very, very soon and uh, excited for you to check those out. Another thing I'm excited to tell you about is today's Patreon sponsor of the episode. His name is Kyle Slavich. Kyle says that he loves hearing about how people just fall in love with the banjo and, you know, manage to just go right out and get one because that's the same kind of thing that happened to him. He wasn't raised around the banjo, but as soon as he saw someone playing one, he knew he had to have one and he's been at it ever since. And Kyle, I can totally rate, relate. I share your enjoyment of those kind of stories when they come up on the podcast. So Kyle, once again, thank you so much for your support on Patreon. It, uh, it helps a lot to keep the show up and running, and it's much appreciated. Uh, for the rest of you, if you're interested in becoming a patron of the podcast yourselves, hop along to patreon.com slash banjo podcast, and that'll show you all the different rewards available for different levels of contributions. Um, and that goes directly to help support the show and offset the production costs. So I really appreciate all of you who have done that. Of course, if you're unable to do the Patreon thing, the main other ways to show your support of the podcast are to subscribe, rate, share the podcast with friends, tell everyone about it, help spread the word that way, or also a great way is to just drop me a line. You can email me at pickyfingersbanjopodcast at gmail.com. I get emails all the time from listeners. I try to respond to every single one. And uh, I really enjoy reading them and uh, connecting with all you. So keep that up. And uh, I appreciate all of the ways that we can work together to uh, grow this banjo-loving community. Today's special guest is Greg Deering. Now, Greg, while he is not a professional banjo player, has nonetheless, of course, had a huge impact on the banjo world He and his wife, Janet, of course, are the founders of the Deering Banjo Company. So 
undoubtedly you've all heard a lot about them and maybe are even familiar with the wide variety of banjos that they offer. Uh, but anyway, Greg has amazing stories about how he got started and the, the early days of starting his own banjo company. And I particularly loved hearing his stories about the work that he does now with Jens Kruger as somewhat of a, a design consultant. And it's, it's just fascinating to hear about how much goes into the design of an instrument that a lot of us consider to be fairly traditional. They're, they're still making advancements, and, and I love hearing about all that. And uh, Greg was very kind in sharing a lot of those types of stories with us, so I know you're going to enjoy that. I also did want to give a special shout-out uh, to Elderly Instruments, and in particular, uh, Stan Werben, Cynthia Bridge, and Andy Wilson for making this episode possible. Greg was doing an event there, and all those folks that I just mentioned, along with Greg, of course, were very gracious in uh, making some special arrangements for me to go to the store and set up and have some some space to interview Greg. So everyone at Elderly, I really appreciate that, of course. It's good to, uh, it's good to know people on the inside, I guess. But anyway, that was great, and uh, enjoy the episode with Greg Deering. Greg Deering and my wife Janet and I started Deering Banjo Company uh, way back in 1975. Janet and I became a couple because we both had, independent of each other, interests in having a family business. Yeah. At that point, I was already in instrument making and wanted to build banjos. And at the time, she didn't even know what a banjo was. She said, What's a banjo? And I said, you know that round thing I play at church? And she goes, oh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> she, she knew it. She just didn't know that she knew what a banjo yes. was. Yeah, okay. But I, I first got interested in the banjo. My first exposure was because of the Kingston Trio. Mm -hmm. My first exposure to them was when the song Tia Wanna Jail. Okay. Was not, a, I don't know if I'm familiar with that one, but I'll look it up now. To go our so here we'll stay. Well, look it up. Yeah. It, it hit the radio waves and was a number one hit for a while in the late 50s. Okay. And a friend of my dad's wrote the poem that became the song. Oh, how cool. Uh, but he never got credit for oh, that it. That was going to be my next question, is, is if he was getting some checks It was a guy named Ed White, and, and the song is actually about a real event that happened in, in Tijuana. Okay. Where they opened a casino and, and sent invitations to people in San Diego. Uh -huh. And um, I have vivid memories of my parents having the invitation and debating whether they were going to go. Oh, you actually remember the, the yeah. event playing out. And, okay. um, and it's good that, and they did go or they did not? No, my parents did not go. Okay. But where my dad worked at the Convair Wind Tunnel, um, the secretary down there had friends from out of town, mm -hmm. and they decided to go. And the federalities raided it, and they ended up in the Tijuana jail. Oh, no. So Ed White wrote a poem called The Gambler's Lament. Yeah. Send great. my mail to the Tijuana jail. Yeah. And uh, because it became a hit song, my parents bought the 45. It had Tijuana Jail on one side, Cindy Cindy on the other. Okay. And I just fell in love with it. But at the time, that was all I knew about the Kingston Trio, except they did 7-Up commercials on TV. Oh, did they? That's and funny. And they were on the, John, on the Jack Benny show a couple of times. Okay. But other than that, I didn't know anything about them. But you heard the banjo, and did you want to play it, or you just uh, 
decided that that was a type of music you enjoyed? At that time, the banjo wasn't grabbing me. I just loved the kind of music. Yeah. But I played the violin or the viola in the school orchestra from junior grade school all the way through high school. And in junior high, my best friend was the French horn player. Okay. And I went over to his house one day, and he had a Kingston Trio album. Uh huh. Didn't know it existed. Yeah. And he put it on the record player. This magical music started coming out, and then Chris, who was a phenomenal musician, reached over and picked up a guitar and started playing along with the record. Oh wow! Yeah. Thought I thought I'd die in God in heaven. Yeah, that's. It, it seems so obvious to us now, but when you first make that connection, that I can I can do this thing that I enjoy hearing from people. It's it's a good feeling. But I was looking at the record, listening to this music. Chris was playing the guitar. And at that instant, I said, I got to get a banjo. Mm -hmm. I haven't looked back. So you did get get a banjo, I assume? Mm -hmm. Great. So I, I don't even know about your playing. Did you, did you play pretty seriously after that? It was a struggle for me. I'm not a real good musician. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I could sight read on the violin and the viola pretty good enough to play in a school orchestra, but was never going to go into the symphony. Yeah. So yeah. I started leaning more towards the banjo and the guitar. But in San Diego, 1963, when I was 13 and got my first banjo, I was 16 before I got to see another human being playing the banjo. Oh wow! So it was it was a pretty solitary pursuit there. For, All I had for was the Kingston Trio records and Pete Seeger's book. Okay, that's it. But then fast forward, you you at least made the uh, made the church band. Apparently, did I hear you say that that you? Well, when, when I got into college, I got to be part of a folk rock band, and we did a lot of church music, and I was actually in charge of doing the song service at our church for three and a half years. Had to come up with the music, with the agenda. I had to give the, the sermon, the whole bit. I had to do that. For you had to do that, too? Three and a oh, half wow. years. Yeah. It was 40 minutes every Sunday morning. Uh huh. And I was going to school full time. Had a part-time job at a movie theater, was the advisor for the junior high and high school youth group, and working at the American Dream Building Instruments. So you had tons of spare time to <laughs> to work on your banjo playing and have a social life and get a lot of sleep and all that. Well, the guys that uh, I was playing music with were really good musicians. And the lead singer, uh, his favorite band was um, Jethro Tull. Oh, yeah, cool. And... Uh, more than once, I worked him 54 into a service. Oh, no kidding. Oh, well, I saw him in the city And on the mountains of the moon His cross was rather bloody Oh, and he could hardly roll his stone And see the city Did anybody, was it just over everyone's head? No, um, no, not okay. necessarily. I, I was good at tying it in. Used a lot, a lot of uh, Woody Guthrie. Uh huh. So I was a little bit of a renegade. Yeah. How cool. But well, it, that, it was, that's it, the point, right? Just to kind of get a little contemporary and more accessible for people to. And it's a to, relatively small church, and they gave, they gave me all the room. Yeah. I mean, there was nobody breathing down my neck saying I was doing something wrong. That's great. It was filled the place every Sunday. And so out of this came you and Janet's pursuit of a family business. Do you, do you remember what your goal was in starting that business? Well. Or what, you, what did you think that you could um, provide through that business that maybe was not being already served by other? In the, in the initial years, my motivation was to build the banjo that I could have afforded when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Because in 1963, when I fell with the banjo, the Kingston Trio was playing the Vega Pete Seeger long neck. Uh -huh. And in 63, that banjo was over $400. Right. That was a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. So I couldn't afford it. So when I decided to build my first banjo, it was in college, needed a better banjo and couldn't afford it. And I grew up, my dad was a master craftsman, and he, from a very, very young age, taught me to be a good craftsman and a designer. And so I had a pretty good skill set for making stuff already. 
Uh -huh. So I took a wood shop class to have access to the shop and built my first banjo. Oh, that's cool. How do you source all the parts? I'm, I'm, that's a little before my time, so I'm not, you know, now we have so many things available to us, but I imagine that that was a lot more difficult. Well, yes and no. Uh, you, you, you get a hold of every banjo you can find and take it apart, put it back together. And Reverse see engineer it, kind of. Yeah, kind of look at it. Um, at San Diego State, which was where I was going to college, um, he had access to all the back stacks in the library. Mm -hmm. And I found every piece of literature that mentioned anything about a banjo and studied every bit of it. And at what point did you start seeing some success? Did it take did it take quite a while or um, what what were well, some of those growing pains like? I was fortunate enough when I took that woodshop class to just out of dumb luck, be in the right place at the right time. Hmm. And there was two guys in that same class, Sam Ratting and Lee Fulmer, mm -hmm. who were working on opening a business to build guitars. Okay. Sam's brother Gene had a store, music store already, small one, and Sam was building guitars in the back room, and Lee was helping him do it. And the next semester, I took a woodshop class and built a guitar. Okay. And Sam and Lee were in that class, too. Yeah. And they um, rented a shop in Lemon Grove, which is by San Diego, in May of 1970, on May 1st. And they were getting the key at 12 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And without them asking me to, I showed up and watched them get the key and said, I'm here to help. What can I do? And started helping them build benches and run whites and because I knew how to do wiring and stuff. And okay. I just wanted to be part of it. I wasn't waiting to be asked. I, I didn't ask. I just started doing. Yeah. And um, during the course of that first day, I heard them talking about, well, people are going to want us to do repair work. We don't want to do repair work. What are we going to do about that? And I went, I'll do it for you. I'll do yeah, it for you. Yeah, an opening. Yeah. And they said, Okay, but we won't have room for you. I says, I'll take it home. You guys just take it in. I'll take it home. Well, I took the repair work home for a couple of months, and then that started being working so well that they gave me a spot in a corner to build a bench. Very cool. And they called that little shop the American Dream. Huh. The store that his brother had was called the American Dream, and our shop was called the American Dream. And at first, it was just new for everybody. Nobody knew what they were doing. And it eventually evolved into Sam being the only owner. And he ran it like a co-op. It was like he let it be like it was each person that was part of it be their own company. Okay. And I did repair work. I built banjos. And once in a while, I might even do a guitar. But at the end of each month, we'd show Sam our books and we'd give him 20% of what we took in. And it paid all the bills. So those are the earliest Deering banjos, the ones that got mm -hmm. sold out of that store. Do you ever see those kicking around? I had one. Anyone ever show? I those? had one come back to me to get some restoration work on it just about two years ago, and that, oh, was, cool. that was fun. Yeah. What did you What did you think of your work? How were you doing back then? Well, it was one of the better ones that I made. Oh, good. <laughs> And what's interesting, the logo on the top of our peg head, that little banner that says Deering, yeah. that was on the very first banjo I ever made. Oh, no kidding. So I've just had a knack for doing stuff like that. Okay. So gradually you, you started to, to find your way into the, the product lines. Were there some notable players that started giving attention to your, to your products? Did you did you start no, no, with anything like that? Not in the American Dream days. Mm -hmm. It was just all local stuff. Yeah. To make a long story short, the American Dream, one of the guys that I met that was going to the same school, two of the guys in the band I played in were still in high school. Okay. And they said, there's a new kid in school playing the banjo. Hmm. I don't want to hear about another banjo player. And went over to their house one day to practice, and here's this guy playing the banjo, and he's pretty good. Yeah. And I said, how long have you been playing? And he goes, oh, about six months. And I've been playing for years, and he was better than me. Right. But I told him about the American Dream and building instruments, and pretty soon he was out to American Dream, buying some fret wiring, some binding and stuff. And he went to, 
took it back to his high school wood shop and built a guitar. Okay. And his name was Bob Taylor. Oh, interesting. He was a banjo player. Yeah. I never knew that. He's a good banjo player. And he still plays as far as you know? Or yeah, at once, least once, dabbles? once in a while he'll still walk around his factory at Christmas time playing Christmas carols on the banjo for everybody. Maybe maybe you're lucky he didn't go into banjo building because he's good at his own thing too. Yeah. There's... But um, when he got out of high school, he started working at the American Dream. And Bob and I were the only ones besides Sam, the owner, who weren't smoking marijuana all the time. And mm -hmm. our 20% were paying most of the bills. Okay. And then it January 74, Jen and I got married, and she had a job in in Washington, D.C. for a while. Okay. So we left. And while we were gone, Bob's 20 percents didn't go as far, and Sam was wanting to close up. Yeah. And Bob and his, his friend Kurt, and at the time they had a third partner, Steve, convinced Sam to sell to him, and they started Taylor Guitars. Okay. We got wow. back to San Diego in October. And I went out to see the, how the guys were doing at the Dream, and found out it was now Taylor Guitars. And there was was there not a place for you anymore they involved in that? They hired me and set me up to do repair work, just what I was doing before. Mm -hmm. But now instead of me doing paying them twenty percent, they were paying me twenty percent. Oh yeah, that's that's a little and, different situation. And uh, we was newly married. We had a brand new son, and uh, a new guy started showing up in San Diego. Is in the Navy. He was a banjo player. He's a pretty good banjo player. And I went down and took a lesson from him and uh -huh. got to know him. And he had was starting to buy up old Gibson's tenors and having me make five string necks for him. And okay. Started doing a fair amount of that. And then he came up with his own banjo rim, having me start making necks for those. And at one point he says, You know, you should be earning more than you are here. He says, Let's be partners. Hmm. We can set up shop in my garage. So I said, okay, let's do that. Yeah. So I built myself a pretty nice Gibson reproduction, and so I sold it and put it into the partnership, and we started being partners, and his name was Jeff Stelling. Oh, yeah, how cool. You, you brought up all these Gibson repro things, and again, it's a little before my time, but I'm imagining that you were up against a bit of a force in terms of there were a lot of banjo players out there who have probably who had probably been told for decades that the only thing you should want is these Gibson banjos. And how did you did you have any well, sort of strategy of how to chip being, away at that? Being uh, in San awareness? Diego back at that time, I was isolated from that. Okay, there was no oh, it's got to be a Gibson on the West Coast. Yeah, okay. that that was an East Coast thing. It wasn't that people didn't have them or didn't like them, but it wasn't like I was building thousands of banjos. It, yeah. was, it was the beginning, and it was we were following a passion where the, the passion and the entrepreneurship isn't about having some great talent. It's about having this need to do what you're doing that's so intense that you can't not do it, yeah. and there's just no way to be dissuaded. Right. In the very beginning, I was told over and over by many people that I had no business doing it, that I didn't know what I was doing, you shouldn't do that. And there are a lot of really successful people who have probably been told that, and thank goodness they ignored it. Yeah. That's good. Uh -huh. You know, so you were you were seeing these Gibsons, which, for better or worse, were kind of the, the standard professional thing at the time. Did you have anything that you intentionally tried to to make distinctive to Deering's that was different from what Gibson were doing? Well, initially, I didn't worry too much about trying to get that high-end market. Mm -hmm. I was after the banjo that was a good banjo yeah. that could um, people could afford. Right. And, uh, you know, a fancy tone ring banjo was not that banjo. Yeah. And in... in the days that we were building the Stellings, we built about the first 600 Stellings okay. um, before the Deering and Stelling relationship ended. That's a whole other story. But there was a guy up in the mountains up above Palm Springs in a little town called Idlewild. His name was Dave Sleater, really fine craftsman that was making these immaculate open back banjos. Hmm. And he made them with steel rims. 
which was highly unusual. Yeah. Um, and his were finely machined and hardened and ground and just beautiful. His craftsmanship was impeccable. But he, he was one of these guys that was obsessed with perfection. And yeah. perf perfection doesn't exist. And he would refuse to sell his banjos if he didn't think they were perfect. So okay. he didn't sell much. So he had a really hard time. And he went into obscurity, and I have no idea where he was. But I thought that the idea of the steel rims was extremely good. Uh -huh. And I started making rims just out of rolled hot roll steel. And when we first started his Deering Banjo Company with our old line, it was that steel rimmed banjo. Is that like similar to what the, like the Boston it's model? Ex exactly okay. what the Boston is. And um, my goal was for the banjo to retail for $150. Okay. This is a 1970. Yeah, we'd have to do some eight, math. Yeah. 78, early 78, let's say late 77. And I got the first one done, and I said, well, Janet, it's going to have to cost at least 175 hmm. So she hit the road and started visiting dealers. And she sold a couple, but most of the dealers said, what's wrong with it? Why is it so cheap? Oh, so you actually, okay, there was a, percep a perception of low quality because of the price point that you made it. So the next trip she went out, a couple weeks later, she raised the price to 275 uh -huh. sold a couple. And again, dealer after dealer would say, what's wrong with it? Oh, my. The next time out, she raised it to 375 and they quit asking what was wrong with it. And just bought them instead? Just bought them. Oh, how great. So that's, is that a turning point? That for... was a turning point okay. for us. Folks, I got to hop in here still from the Windy Backyard Studio to talk to you a little bit about the newest podcast sponsor, Elderly Instruments. Elderly Instruments in Lansing, Michigan. They've been family owned since 1972, but have built themselves into the world's most trusted source for new used and vintage stringed instruments. A lot of you know that I used to work there, so I've seen the behind the scenes stuff. I know how the sausage is made, and I can honestly tell you it's still the first place that I go for any of my banjo needs whether it's an instrument or any of the, the usual or unusual accessories that, that go with banjos or really other, any other stringed instrument. Um, although if it's another instrument besides the banjo, is it really considered a need? All of your guitar, ukulele, mandolin wants and banjo needs can be found at Elderly Instruments. They have an incredible selection. My favorite part about working there was that none of the salespeople were on commission. Their only job is to help the customers find the right instrument for them or the right other piece of equipment that will help them in their musical career, musical journey, musical education. They're there to help, they're friendly, they're down to earth, and they know what they're talking about. It's where I go and it's where you should go to. Elderly.com is how you check that out. Or if you happen to be in the Lansing, Michigan area, their showroom is back open and it's absolutely worth checking out. People come there from all over the world and uh, it's definitely worth it. Once again, that's elderly.com. Check it out. Another sponsor of the Picky Fingers Banjo Podcast is Peghead Nation. I'm always proud to recommend them, but especially during these times of staying at home a bit more often than we used to. Peghead Nation's streaming video courses in banjo, guitar, mandolin, fiddle, dobro, upright bass, and ukulele helps you learn bluegrass, old time, and other styles from some of the most talented players and instructors in Roots Music. Among their video courses that they offer, you'll be able to find Beginning Banjo with Bill Evans, Bluegrass Banjo with Bill Evans, Claw Hammer Banjo with Evie Layden, Wade Ward Style Banjo with Bruce Molsky, The Banjo According to Danny Barnes, and also Contemporary Bluegrass Banjo with Wes Corbett. And each of those courses has high quality multi-angle video lessons downloadable notation and tablature, play-along tracks, and then plenty of play-along tunes included. And as a bonus offer for Picky Fingers listeners, if you join any of those video courses, you're going to get your first months free. So if you go to pegheadnation.com and get to the checkout, use the promo code PICKYFINGERS, all one word, lowercase, 
at checkout. And like I said, you'll get the first month free from some of those all-star instructors. So check that out, pegheadnation.com. One of the things that Janet and I did when we first, going back to the Stelling days, we started as partners, but the partnership only lasted for about six months. And Jeff and his wife Gretchen decided they didn't want partner. So they dissolved the partnership and asked us to start Deering Banjo Company, and they contracted us to build the banjos for them. Mm -hmm. Jeff bought a shop building, we rented part of the building from him. And when we started Deering Banjo Company, Janet and I were aware of the statistics about how 90% of businesses fail in the first year. Uh And we're looking at each other and going, are we nuts? Uh So the Small Business Administration was doing a class in um, surviving that first year. Mm -hmm. So we went to the class. And the guy that was teaching it was a guy that had had a chain of music store or uh, toy stores and a gun out of business, and that was his credential. Oh, was it? <laughs> and he told us story after story after story of banjos, or business, businesses oh. <laughs> that, that had gone out of business. And Janet and I were able to observe from that that every one of those businesses, the owners had run into a set of problems that they didn't want to deal with. Mm-hmm. So they quit. Every one of them was solvable, but they decided it was more than they wanted to deal with, so they quit. They basically gave you a list of everything not to do wrong. They didn't actually tell you what well, to do. It was more what they did what... wrong was they quit. Yeah. So Janet and I made a pact with each other that no matter what, we wouldn't quit. Hmm. So when they, when things parted with Stelling, it didn't. It was a difficult time. Yeah. And we had to start all over again. Yeah. And uh, we had to draw on not quitting. And uh, but it worked out well. And at what point did you abandon the the focus on the affordable banjos and move to a wider product line that included more professional caliber instruments? We started making tone ring banjos 81, 82. Mm-hmm. So it was a couple of years. It was after we got established enough to have enough room to tool up for that. Yeah. It's nice to be able to sell something for all those people who are playing during Boston's and then maybe get good enough that they that they want that next step. Well, the, 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 the Boston is an interesting banjo. In the early days when we called it the Intermediate, we'd go to the Bluegrass Club, and when we get out of the car on the other side of the, of the parking lot, we'd listen to the banjos and we'd notice, hey, there's one that's really carrying all the way over here. Uh-huh. And what was really to delight us is we'd go over to where the club was meeting and see who's playing and that banjo we could hear all the way across the parking lot was always the intermediate. Oh, interesting. So there's a special quality that that steel rim has. It's just, it's not a pre-war flathead, yeah. but, but it's a good banjo. Yeah. And a really good parking lot picker. So that became our mainstay. And um, it morphed into the Boston when we needed to kind of upgrade things. Uh-huh. We'd actually had a, a, an even lighter weight steel rim that we called the Basic. And at one point, we discontinued the Basic and just made the Boston from that point on. Every once in a while, we think about discontinuing the Boston, but and then the sales will go up. Right. <laughs> and the, the Boston six-string, which we call the B6, is... The, the mainstay six-string banjo, the great yeah. majority of top number one hit type players playing the, the six-string banjo are playing our B6. Even more than the the deluxe, for even, example? Even more than the deluxe. Huh, how interesting. Have you been responsible for most of the product development in terms of new ideas? Because one of the things about Daring that's so great is just how prolific you are in, in terms of offering... So many, even within a model like the Sierra, you can get the maple and the radius and the uh, resonator pops off, you know, just really catering to almost anything that someone might be looking for. Well, until about five years ago, I was responsible for all of it. Uh But about five years ago, we hired an engineer that could help me with some of the tooling. 
Uh -huh. um, he's only able to help us part time now. But some of the long standing employees that we've had have just matured and grown into more of an executive for the company. Mm -hmm. Things like wanting to make the seer out of maple yeah. came from a marketing department yeah. and not just me. Our, our white oak banjo happened as a viable product because we done we're doing some research in white oak rims and having a ball because it sounded really good. Yeah. And the marketing staff came to me and said, can we do a White Oak Sierra for our 40th anniversary? And I said, sure. Yeah. It was the first one we did that was not only a rim, but the neck was White Oak, too. And it was incredibly good sounding. Huh. So that kind of innovation has started to happen from more sources than just me in the last five years. Yeah. Just like what we were talking about, how you don't necessarily micromanage the relationships with people like me, it sounds like you're really good at letting people who are smart, who work for you, be smart and think of cool things to do. Are there any sort of experimental things, maybe similar to the White Oak that failed miserably and have never seen the light of day? There must be at least some of those. I'm, I'm wondering if there's any particularly entertaining failures <laughs> that, that, uh, that we didn't ever get to see. Um, hmm. The first electric banjo we made was a bit of a disaster. Oh, what was that? What was that like? It had this massive wings on a resonator. <laughs> it was pretty wild looking. We got laughed at a lot when we took that to the show. But I was inspired to pursue the electric banjo because I kept running into banjo players earning their living with electric guitar. And they wanted to play the banjo, but in a loud environment, it was, wasn't working. Yeah, sure. And the first one didn't work out at all. We only built one of them, and it's hanging in our daughter's office. But it gave me the, provided the groundwork to end up with what became our Crossfire. Sure, sure. And even, even the Crossfire, when we first showed up to the NAMM show with it, you know, we got jaded for it and laughed at and people would go mm, yeah. mm, and hold up the cross like keep the vampire <laughs> yeah, away, you know. Away. <laughs> but uh, that all went away when Bela started playing it. Yeah. He has a way to change people's opinions about yeah. about stuff like that. And then it got even and then the next player actually about the same time Bela started playing it, Roy Clark started playing it. Oh, did he? I didn't realize that. That's cool. Yeah, and uh, he, it was not his main thing, but he would use it in every show. And Roy, as good of a musician he was, which he's f as good as good yeah, gets. Yeah, top notch, yeah. Um, he was an even better entertainer. Yeah, and yeah, And when sure. he would bring that crossfire out, he had us put one of the illuminized heads on it. Oh, yeah. And he would get it in the spotlight and shine it on the audience. The the prism ones? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so it's, yeah. And, and he, he would get applause just for the crossfire. Look at this, and everybody would clap. And... Just kind of at the novelty, but just the, the showmanship and the presentation. Oh, that's really cool. Tell me about your, and by you, I mean the company's relationship with uh, Jens Kruger and what type of stuff he has. I heard you, I was popping in and out up there and I heard a bit of it, but um, as a big fan of Jens and I'm just in awe of the, uh, the knowledge that he has. He's an incredible phenomenon. Uh -huh. The first time we met Jens was at the Merle Fest in Wilkesboro yeah. in the early days. And at Wilkesboro, they have a cafeteria behind the stage that they feed all the artists and the sponsors and stuff and keep everybody taken care of back there. And this is before they built the big stage and it was just tables on the grass behind the temporary stage. And Jan and I had just sat down to eat and the guy sitting across from me saw my name tag and he goes, you're Greg Daring? Why do you build your banjos this way? How come you do that? And blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and, it's and, not what you expected the hospitality to... Yeah. And that was Jens. <laughs> and we didn't have a clue as to who he was. Uh -huh. But he was just intense. He goes, well, I'm the reason you're selling the banjos in Europe because I tell my friend... Blah, blah, blah. And the guy sitting next to him, which at the time was... We didn't know, but it was Uwe. Uwe's rolling his guys going, <laughs> oh, no. And, and Jens is just intense going... Blah, 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 blah. And... After 
almost 10 minutes of all this, talking about why we do this, and how can we do that? And he pauses a little bit, and I says to him, well, more than 50% of the way a banjo sounds is dependent on who's playing it. Yeah. And he leaned back, and he said, no, it's more like 80%. <laughs> <laughs> and we laughed, and we've been friends ever since. Oh, that's great. So what... Um so eventually it became a, an official collaboration though, right? Well, we sent a good time home with him for, at that meeting. He recorded a children's Christmas album with it, hmm. sent it to us. And then a couple of years or a year or two after that, he was at IBMA mm -hmm. and it was getting towards the end of the show. And Jens was hanging around the Gibson booth and there was nobody there. And Janet was standing there and, Janet goes, Jens, what are you doing over there? Well, I was supposed to meet Todd. They want to, me to endorse their banjos. They want to give me a banjo. And he goes, what do you want one of those for? So they started talking, and, and, and Jens asked Janet, or Janet asked Jens, why don't you work with us? And, he, and Janet, Jens asked Janet, well, what's your philosophy of the way banjos that sound? And Janet says, well, we don't have one. We do our best to make the banjo that our customer wants. You know, and we have a, some understanding of what makes sound, and not everybody wants the same thing. And Jens thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. And he says, well, how can you make a banjo that's what I want? And I says, well, we'll Janet said to him, we'll start with doing our best, and if you don't like it, we'll build you another one, and if you don't like that, we'll keep we'll keep building banjos until we get the one you like. And he goes, you do that for me? And Janet goes, absolutely. Right. So at that point, we had a relationship. Yeah, and he obviously had already a list of critiques of your work. So he's a guy who knows what he wants. He, he knows so what he wants. So we immediately started working on it, and we it didn't take us too long to come up with something he liked. Yeah. And that went on on just an informal handshake basis until they needed to immigrate to the United States. Hmm. And... Um, Jens was working with us. He was coming to the factory. We visited him in Switzerland once, and it was really blossoming. Yeah. But what he needed to get his visa, he couldn't do it without already having a job here. Oh, And Janet had told him, if you ever need a job, you know, we're here. Yeah. So one afternoon, we got a call from Jens. Janet got a call from Jens. and says, did you really mean that about the job? And Janet goes, Yeah. And he said, well, I have to have a job in order to get my visa. And Janet goes, you got it. Perfect, yeah. So he's gotten a paycheck every week from us ever since. It's, we're going on 16 years now. Oh, how incredible. 17 years. So what types of contributions has he made and what suggestions? I don't know, you know. Massive changes in our tone ring. Yeah. The geometry of it, the metallurgy of it. Huge changes in the dimensions and structure of our rims, refinements in minute details and distances. Like, do you remember exactly what? Like, um, like more of a certain component in the tone ring, or was it a well? Shape? All of our tone rings prior to that had a real sharp radius on the top. Okay. And he got us to use very a, pointy, like yeah. a corner. Yeah. Okay. He got us to use a much rounder radius, and we've probably done two dozen different configurations over the years, refining it, testing things. And when he has us make a new tone ring and change a dimension, he just puts it through the ringer and yeah. plays it and plays it, records it, and has Uwe listen to it and record it. They just, and he'll come back and go, no, that went the wrong direction. Let's do this. And when something new happens, it's like, when the first time he did a workshop tour in uh, Australia, there's a guy down there that's got a whole bunch of pre-wars. And he's one of these guys like Snuffy Smith that scientifically analyzed the alloy in all of them. Yeah. And a lot of the banjo world thinks there was one alloy. And there's, oh, right. there's been makers over the years that goes, I've discovered the alloy. Yeah. There isn't one alloy. Sure. And this guy had a banjo that he said, well, you know, this is my favorite banjo, but it's probably not a good banjo because it's got a lot of lead in it. And Jens said he played it, and he goes, this is just like Earl's banjo. Oh. Earl's banjo had lead, a lot of lead in the tone ring. Interesting. 
So he came home and he said, Can we got to make, make some tests out of lead? So we had some castings made with the lead alloy. And he got them and he said, you know, they sound really good. So we might switch to these. But he, he, does, he never lets his first impression guide him and he plays them for weeks and he plays them hard and yeah. records them and Uwe listens. And while they sound really good, he said they were extremely sensitive to setup. Okay. Bridge get a little worn, the tailpiece get a little high, head get a little loose, and they became monsters. Uh -huh. so they, it took a lot of keeping after, and he said, it isn't the right move. At least not for any kind of mass production. Yeah. Or, and yeah. then he discovered a pre-war that it had a pure copper tone ring. And he goes, you know, there was, only, there was no real foundry in Kalamazoo. There was only a wire company that made copper wire. Uh-huh. And they said, I suspect that they, they're, they may have made some copper tone rings. And, I, and that fit in with what I knew. Back in the American Dream days, we found about this NAM organization, the National Association of Music Merchants. Mm -hmm. And they were having a little show at the Marriott at LAX. And we said, let's go up to that. So us hippies went up to this NAM show. Mm -hmm. Very, very small compared to what the NAMM show is now. Yeah. I mean, it was in one banquet room at the Marriott. Yeah. And the main exhibitor was Coast Wholesale Music. And I got to talk him with one of the salesmen who was this older gentleman. And when he heard, I told him that I made banjos, he goes, well, I used to work for Gibson. Okay. I said, well, what did you do for Gibson? And I said, well, I was a purchaser. And I would get put on a boat go to Central America to buy mahogany. I would go to Brazil to buy rosewood. They'd send me to Africa to buy ebony. Yeah. And uh, when a boatload of wood would come in the Great Lakes, to Kalamazoo, and the shipment would come in, I'd always sneak in the back door to find out if I was in trouble or if I was the hero. <laughs> That's great. But he said, back in those days, this is in the 20s and 30s, Yeah. he said they were putting in the elevated trains in Chicago, and they were Grapping out the old trolleys, mm -hmm. and I would make regular trips down to the salvage yards and to buy bronze, and I'd send it up to the foundry or the foundry to cast Melt down. And, yeah. and he said there was times when I would buy a whole carload of bells from the trolleys. Wow. He said there was other times when they didn't have any bells, and I'd buy old fire hydrants, as long as it was red bronze. He said, there was a time when I bought a whole shipment of old manhole covers, uh -huh. sent them up to the foundry, and they'd make tone rings. So I had this story from a guy that was the guy that bought the metal for the tone rings. That's hilarious, just thinking about all these banjos that everyone's playing that used to be manhole covers or bells or, or whatever. So as a banjo maker, I had the advantage of already knowing it wasn't one alloy. Right, right. And then when, when Snuffy Smith verified that and documented it, and then the guy in Australia documented it. So we made some copper tone rings. Uh -huh. And uh, he says, yeah, they're okay, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna go there. What did I hear you, I, I overheard upstairs, you said something about, and, and maybe I'm mixing and matching stories here, was it Jens's job to reduce, what did you say, resonances in the parts? Or is this, is this confusing stories well, here? Unwanted overtones. Okay. And that was, like Jens had said, explained to me, that was the problem with the early Baroque violin. Yeah. Overtones that are out of harmony with the primary notes, so it's yeah. don't blend well. Yeah. But the banjos always had some amount of that. And with his help in the tone ring design, rim design, overall internal dimensions, and really studying the air volumes and heads and all of this stuff, we've managed to eliminate the great majority of those unwanted tone rings. And our eagle banjo is even further into that research. Because Philip Zanon, their sound man for years, got a hold of some computer software where you could draw a, a, a part in this computer software and inject vibrations into it in the computer model. Okay. And it would tell you what how this part would vibrate It'll and give what, you the output and oh, what tones yeah. it would create oh how incredible so they put a gibson tone ring in they put one of our tone rings in which is basically a refined gibson style tone uh -huh. ring, and discovered that it 
had a lot of overtones that were out of harmony with the input frequency. Okay. So Jens showed me the results, told me the results. He says, I wonder if there's a ring that doesn't do that. So we just started experimenting. Yeah. And we made ring after ring, different materials, um, different shapes. And we finally came up with the ring that when they put it into the computer model, all the overtones were in harmony with the input note. And what was the composition in terms of the the metals of that? Was that heavier on the lead, just like Jens no. had thought? Well, the tone ring that we're using has a little bit of lead in it, but not a lot. But it was more the mass and the shape than it was the alloy. Oh, interesting. When we make that tone a lot ring, of variables. When we make that tone ring out of steel, it still has a good input overtone ratio where there's very little that's out of harmony with the input note. And when we made the, the final configurations where we knew we had it licked, I made two banjos, one with a brass tone ring and one with a bronze tone ring. Mm -hmm. And I sent them to Yance and didn't tell him which one was which. Yeah. And he played them and played them and played them and recorded them and went through the whole thing with them. And he said, one of them's clearly better than the other one. I think it's the bronze one. And I said, well, which one is it? Tell me which one it was. Say, yes, that's the brass one. Huh. And he didn't believe me. I says, well, we go ahead and scratch some plating off the tone rings and check. And he says, I'll be darned. The brass <laughs> one sounds better. That's great. The Picky Fingers Banjo Podcast is brought to you by our sponsor, Deering Banjos, who want you to know that banjo teachers love good times. In a recent survey conducted by Deering, over 200 banjo teachers were asked, how likely is it that you would recommend the good time banjo to your students? An overwhelming 85% responded that they would, with the number one reason being that good times are easy to play. Even Good Time Ambassador and 2019 IBMA Banjo Player of the Year, Kristen Scott Benson agrees that you will not find a better banjo than this in the price range of the Deering Good Time. With the Good Time Banjos, Deering understands the importance of starting out with a banjo that will help not hinder your banjo learning experience, which is why they make sure that each and every Good Time Banjo leaves looking great, feeling great, and sounding great. For more information and to see exclusive videos from Good Time Ambassadors Kristen Scott Benson and Pete Wernick, head over to DeeringBanjos.com slash Teachers Love Good Times. There's another phenomenon that that tone ring has. When Jens was a young boy walking home from school, he got to go and spend time with a master violin maker that had a shop that he walked by and away home from yeah. school. And he and that master would spend hours talking about how this violin was made and why it sounds this way and how that violin's made and how it sounds this way. And this was a shop that had Amantes and Granaris and Stradivarius in it. The best of the best, yeah. So Jens was getting that kind of education and as a young boy. Uh -huh. And one of the things he learned from that master was when you see a picture of a violin maker holding a T violin top mm -hmm. up to his ears and tapping it says it's an erroneous picture he says the frequencies thereafter aren't ones that you can hear with your ear and in a violin that's a really good violin when you're tapping the top like that there will be overtones that that top produces that are well below the human hearing range and they have a profound effect on the notes that you can hear Okay. When Jens first told us this was when he was still living in Switzerland, and, and he and Philip had a studio in between their houses. And we were in the studio, and Jens put on some Mozart and pulled all the low frequencies out, and all the rest of the music got really thin. Yeah. He put back the low frequencies, and it got rich again. Yeah. And he said a really good violin goes a full octave below what you can hear. And a great violin... Huh goes two octaves below what you can hear. And those frequencies you can't hear, you feel them, you hold the tone ring or the violin top and you hit it, you feel them with your fingers. Okay. And the best of the Gibson style tone rings can just reach an octave. Well, when we got the final configuration of the Eagle tone ring done, uh -huh. it goes a full two octaves. That's really interesting. Yeah, fascinating. So talk about the interactions once you've solved that, then it also has to interact with the rim and the neck and the head and the bridge. And there's this whole 
system at work, what are some things that you've discovered that, uh, that need to be considered for that to, to have well, reap the full benefits, I guess, from all this work that you've done on the tone ring? It's no one thing. Yeah. And some of it is simple as being able to control your manufacturing process so they fit right on every rim mm -hmm. to where our machining process really gets it done every time and there's not one that's loose and another one that's tight. Yeah. And um, when you're making a rim out of wood, doesn't matter how good you season the wood, they can still move. Yeah. And if we send a banjo to Yance and the rim move, boy, we hear about it. <laughs> So, I bet. And, and he's, when he comes to the factory, even today, first thing he does is go around and look at everything, especially in assembly. And within an hour, he's back in my office with a list of everything we're doing wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's pretty difficult, but it's extremely valuable. Well, he's so meticulous and methodical that, yeah. That's, in the that's early amazing. years, when he first started coming to the factory, even before he moved to the United States, he came to me one day and I want to show you something. And they went over to one of our banjos. Back then we were still using Prestel tailpieces and he hit it with his thumb and went, ding. Uh -huh. And he said, that's a noisy tailpiece. Hit a cursor, ding. He says, they're not noisy. He went over to our good time and it went, dunk. And he goes, that's a quiet tailpiece. That's a really good tailpiece. He says, we need you to make a tailpiece like that for the Deerings. So we did. And so we've got a good, quiet tailpiece on the Deerings. Okay. And so that's a test that anybody at home could do is just kind of give it a good but whack it, on the tailpiece and listen for that overtone. It hasn't completely taken over because there's a lot of top pros that are so used to the way a banjo feels when they're playing with the Presto mm -hmm. that, yes, it's just right now getting us to start seeing if we can't take the banjo that one of the top pros is set ours aside, getting that banjo back, putting a presto on it, setting it up the way their pre-war is set up, and then seeing if it doesn't, they don't like it even better. Because there's, while the presto is noisy and it adds a lot of overtones that make it hard for the sound man and makes it more difficult in the studio, it's what that player's used to. Because it's yeah. not just what he hears, it's also what he feels. Yeah. And the Presto is a lot looser tone, uh, tailpiece, and that gives you a certain feel in your attack with the right hand. Yeah. And um, Jens is theorizing that, that that's a difference, that even though the tailpiece we have works better on, on a mixing board at a concert, works better in the studio, it's not got all those extra overtones, it feels different. And when a guy really knows what he's doing and he likes that feel, he doesn't want to go to that uh, the other feel. Yeah. So we're actually going to start seeing if we can't win some of these guys over by taking their existing deering and putting a presto back on it. Okay, yeah. It goes back to what Janet had initially told him. You're trying to make the tool that an artist needs to, to be themselves and not impose your will on... Yeah, one of the things that doing. I say in all my workshops is there's a psychological aspect to loving your, your, your banjo. And it's not necessarily something that's scientifically valid, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to be. Yeah, It's something you, you have fallen in love with it being a certain way, and it doesn't matter if it's the best or the worst or what somebody else thinks about it. If that's what you love, that's what you should have. If it was any other way, you'd only have to make one model, right? And it would be perfect for everybody. Man, that doesn't exist. Right, exactly. Part of the advantage that we have, having made so many banjos and, and, and communicate with so many customers, is we see the whole gamut. Yeah. You get in one part of the country and everybody's over here. You get in another part of the country, they're on another spectrum. Um, what, and, in terms of their, their preferences and, mm -hmm. and the instrument, you mean? Yeah. Um, and we're in a position where we get to see all the sides yeah. and learn how to make the banjos for all, all the different. That's why we have so many models. We have more models than anybody. Yeah, you sure do. We have an outrageous amount. Of, and every one of them is there because customers were asking for them. Yeah. Yeah, that's incredible. And um, there's no one banjo that's right for everybody. Do you feel like you're still learning a lot about 
Constantly. how to do all this right. <laughs> Constantly. Constantly. Um, Jens is on a whole new level of um, going after the overtones uh -huh. um, and the tailpiece. I mean, they, he just never quits. No matter how good we get it, as soon as we get past a certain milestone, then it starts all over again. To Look get for us, the next one. Yeah. Next for the next level. Yeah, I heard you say something about the um, the coordinator rods too, right? Was it was a a point of contention that yeah. needed to be to be solved? And like we probably made a dozen different rims where the distance from the head to the resonator, and then the distance from the bottom of the pot where we would vary those things until we found exact dimensions that did less to make things bounce around inside the banjo yeah. to where there was more free for all of the sound to get out rather than bounce around. Yeah. And it's amazing how little bit of differences will make a large change in, in that phenomenon. And say that again. You're talking about the distance between the the flange and the resonator between that, that between gap. the between the head and where the inside surface of the resonator yeah, is, right. and then the space between the bottom and the rim and the inside of the resonator. Yeah, is that a potential development in a model? It would be like a way to actually ad adjust that more in real time from a player's perspective has there there's been a number of attempts to make that adjustable mm -hmm. um and there some adjustability needs to be there for the guys that just got to play with it <laughs> yeah. but the testing we've done if you make it deeper it gets more difficult if you make it shallower it gets more difficult and, yeah. and there's an obvious sweet spot a sweet spot yeah but a lot of the banjo world's got to have that adjustability so they can play it, uh -huh. and and some might prefer it just a little deeper, some might prefer it a little shallower, but we've pretty much got to the point where the measurable lack of unwanted overtones is in the and the and like the imperceptible how much of the energy you're putting in the banjo is really just freely flowing out and getting in, into the audience rather than staying right here. You got it kind of focused in on how, how you think it needs to be. And there's some, some really basic research being done right now. A few years ago, I got an email from a guy named David Pulitzer, who is a physics professor at Caltech. Okay. And he'd gotten a grant to do basic physics research on the banjo. I think I've read, he's, he's published this, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like I've read this. Yeah, the acoustics of it. And um, I've gotten to know him over the years. And a couple of years ago, he was down with his wife and we were having lunch. And his wife leaned over to me and said, David will never tell you this, but he's a Pulitzer Prize winning. I mean, a, a Nobel Prize winning. <laughs> and Yeah, and his name, notwithstanding the fact yeah, that there's, yeah. It is, his, his Nobel Prize was in particle physics. Oh, wow. And David said, well, I was lucky enough to have done some good work when I was young. <laughs> but now that I'm old, they let me play. And he just got a, one of our banjos from us and sent it to one of his colleagues in um, England who's doing laser mapping of the way the banjo head moves and the way the bridge moves and sent the results to Jens, and they were all surprised that the bridge was moving in ways that we didn't know about. Oh. So there's massive stuff like that happening, and, and I've been able, we've been fortunate to be able to get Jens and David Pulitzer together. Oh, wow. And when, that, when, that we, when we get them together, like we might be at, out to dinner after the damn show, and they too, they kind of fade away to that end of the table, and they're in their own world. Oh, yeah. And they talk Sounds back like and an forth. interesting world, yeah. And Jens can talk to David on his level. Kenny, and, okay. And, and David loves it because Jens can talk on a level of knowing what overtones and sounds do from a player's level. Yeah, he can interpret it. Like that, that very yeah. few people can play at a level where they really have any clue as to what they're talking about. Yeah. And that's what's really unique about Jens. Yeah, yeah, it really is incredible. I don't want to keep you too long, but is there anything else you'd like to share about what you've maybe learned or maybe a 
difference that you see in in today's uh, needs of the banjo world as compared to the 80s or 90s? Well, what we're seeing is the banjo is escaping its stereotype boundaries. Yeah. And yeah. it's moving back out into genres that has never existed. Yeah. See, the, the, the modern banjo developed by Joel Sweeney in 1840, that banjo had the place in American pop music until about 1930 that the guitar has now. Sure. And it's because it worked better pre-amplification yeah. on stage. Yeah, it was loud. And once amplification hit, the banjo didn't work any better. Uh -huh. And it wasn't until John Cavanaugh came up with his banjo pickup that the banjo can now stand on the stage right next to an electric guitar. Yeah. And um, more than anything, I'm excited about the banjo and the love of the banjo and the magic of its music is expanding to more people. I'm more interested in people loving the banjo, playing the banjo, than whether or not it's our banjo. Yeah. Um, there's so much room for the banjo to expand without having to take anything from anybody else uh -huh. to just be part of it, too. It's like if 10% of the guitar players in the world would decide they also want to play the banjo, they don't have to quit playing the guitar. Yeah. But if they also play the banjo, it would exponentially expand the entire banjo world. Yeah. We have competitors that routinely thank us for making the good time banjo because without that being on the market and building new banjo players... Um, there wouldn't be anyone to buy theirs either. That they know they're selling more banjos because we do the good time banjo, which is helping there be more banjo players. Yeah, So I'm, our greatest passion is for there just to play and be more banjo players. Yeah, that's it's, fantastic. It is just a matter of spreading the magic. Because the other thing that's cool about the banjo is they've been around since prehistoric times. One of my friends who was here tonight, Dennis Pate, when he was in the Army, he was worked with the State Department and spent a couple of years in Africa. Uh -huh. And he brought back this carved bowl or boat-shaped instrument that had a skin on it. It was tied, so it was a form of a drum, and it had a pole on it and pegs and some strings. Yeah. And it's an instrument they play in Africa. Yeah, that's incredible. And he brought one of those home, and he gave it to me. I've got it in my living room. First time we went to the British Museum... I went to the Egyptian exhibit, mm -hmm. and they had one just like it, except it was a little bit bigger, and it was 3,500 years old. Yeah, how incredible. Uh, drums with strings have been around for a very, very long time. They sure have. It's in our genetic makeup. That's why people like the banjo. It is. that That's that's what half of these people say, is they're, they're just drawn to the to the sound of it for whatever reason. The, the greatest growth area that we're seeing in the banjo too is something that both Jens and I have seen coming and we're delighted that it is coming. And it's the greatest growth in the banjo market right now is in claw hammer banjos. Interesting. Do you have an explanation for that? It's easier to sing with, it's sweeter, it's more fun. You don't have to be a virtuoso to make good music. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's more like the banjo style for everybody. Yeah. Last question. Who are your favorite banjo players? Jens. Yeah. Oh, it's hard to single guys out, but the first banjo player I really fell in love with was um, Alan Monday. when we were building the Stelling Banjos, Alan was living in L.A. and he was down a lot. And I got to know him and got to hear him. Many a Saturday, I'd be out in the shop building banjos and Alan would be sitting there practicing. And I'd get an Alan Monday concert for four hours. Oh man, he's a fine choice as a way to answer that question. Since you're a sponsor, I think I, I plug your website every episode, but just in case someone missed it, tell everyone how to find Deering Banjos and information about 
about what you do online and well we're at the normal www.deeringbanjos with an s on it.com yeah it's right there and it's a i will say that even if you're not in the market for a banjo or whatever there's really great information on your site uh tutorials explanations of some basic setup things it's it's a worthwhile resource, even aside from the marketing and sales aspect. Well, we've got a it. we've got a tremendous team of very dedicated people. Our marketing manager is also a very good musician. Mm-hmm. He's uh, got a degree in jazz guitar, but he's also a very accomplished five string bluegrass player, yeah. and an even more accomplished Dixieland four string player. Is that David? David. Yeah. Okay. So I I do deal with him, and I was I was aware that he's a pretty a pretty great player. So on top of that, he's the the graphic artist behind putting our catalog and our webpage together. Well, but he works with the whole team. It's it's a whole team. Everyone seems to be doing a good job. So, hey, thanks for everything, Greg. I love hearing the stories and hope we get to uh, catch up again sometime. Thanks for your time. Well, you're welcome. It's my pleasure. I'm really glad that you all joined me for this episode of the podcast with Greg Deering of Deering Banjos. You heard a few sound clips in this episode, and in order, they were The Tijuana Jail by the Kingston Trio, Hymn 43 performed by Jethro Tull, Indian Summer performed by Jens Kruger, and Bill Cheatham performed by Alan Mundy. Once again, thank you so much to Kyle Slavich for being today's Patreon supporter. Go to patreon.com slash banjo podcast to learn how you can support the podcast or go to the main website, banjopodcast.com, and hopefully I'll have that uh, the new merchandise set up already. You're going to love the t-shirts and uh, some stickers too. Uh, email me at pickyfingersbanjopodcast at gmail.com. And other than that, everyone, take care of yourselves, stay safe and sane, and tune in for next time, and I'll see you then.